Welcome back to the Band Guide, where we use GarageBand to create professional sounding music. I'm your band guy, Colin, and today is the seventh video in the Ultimate GarageBand Beginner's Guide. This video series is walking through everything you need to know from the very first time you open up GarageBand until you're exporting out your finished, mixed, and mastered song. And in fact, we're actually going to go through the recording, mixing, and mastering process in this video series in just a little bit, so stick around for that. But right now, we're just going through everything you need to understand about GarageBand itself so you can comfortably and confidently record and make your music in it, right? Because ultimately, that's what it's really all about. And speaking of comfortably and confidently recording and making your music, I want to give you something even more to help out with that. I've put together a completely free ultimate garage band guide this guide walks through everything gear you need shortcuts mixing mastering all that stuff completely free in the link in the description below and you can quickly reference back to it anytime you're working on music so you don't have to find a video and find the part in the video where you were thinking about you can just quickly pull up this guide find the section find what you're looking for it's completely free in the link in the description below so be sure to pick it up but let's go and get into today's video where we're talking about the workspace the project menu up here, transport controls, which is how you move around inside your session, your metronome, which is super important if you want a good professional sounding recording, and then all these little buttons that are just kind of floating around. So we're gonna cover all that as quickly as we can in today's video, starting with this workspace here. So the workspace, if you imagine, if you think about old school recording, you had tape machines that would record a bunch of little pieces of tape, multi-track, and then that's how you'd put together the audio. So you'd have the multiple pieces of recorded tape that are playing back at the same time. And we're seeing the same thing here, but instead of having tape that could fail or that is expensive and you have to keep buying more of, you have it completely free just in these little regions. So imagine that this drummer region here is a piece of tape, of analog tape, like a little wound piece of tape you'd see in an old tape machine. And that, but it's just laid out straight, right? So we can take it here, we could chop it, we can move it. That's like moving a piece of tape, cutting and moving a piece of tape. And we will have it as you build out your song, you'll have it for every little piece of your songs. So you'll have drums and you'll have organ if you have organ. You might have guitar and bass and vocals. You'll have all these little regions throughout your song. So that's the workspace. And the cool thing here is that let's say you get a perfect performance of a vocal and you want to have it repeat and you don't necessarily need it to have any variation. Well, we can just take that and copy it and paste it. And now we have that same exact thing twice, right? So if you get the perfect drum part instead of you know, trying to do it again, you can just take it, copy it, and paste it, and now you have that same exact perfect drum part twice. It's super cool. So the modern technology has made recording much, much easier. And that doesn't mean just shortcut and just try to copy paste everything, but there's no shame in doing it. It's done all the time and it can be a huge time saver. Okay, so that is like this main workspace area. Something that's really, really important to know about this workspace is the grid. So we see that up top here. So you can see one, five, nine. And as I zoom in here, you'll see that those we see all the in-between numbers. And as we zoom in even further, we start to see more and more little marks. But at its core, what we're seeing here is each measure. So first measure, second measure, third measure, and then the beats in between. So this would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, because this song is in four, four, which we can see up here. If I change this to three, four, then we're gonna see one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, right? It's gonna show you the beats of the measure in between. And as you zoom in, it's gonna start showing you the finer breakdown of the in-between beats. So we'll start to see eighth notes and 16th notes and 32nd notes, the closer and closer we get in there. So that is the grid. This is really important because if you're recording to any sort of drummer track, the drums are always gonna be perfectly on the grid with a drummer track but we need to then make sure that everything that we add to it are lined up in that same grid so that it all works and plays together and sounds tight and cohesive. So it's a very helpful tool because we can visually see what's going on. Don't over rely on your eyes, but it is helpful in that you can see where is my recorded audio relative to this grid point. So for example, if I just record a little bit of audio here and you see me talking, as I am recording this, you'll see where my individual words are. So if I see, like let's say I'd meant to say 
this word right here. Now I know, okay, I'm a little bit late on that word because I wanted that word to come in right on the downbeat of that measure, right at the start of that measure. So if it's just a little bit, sometimes you can actually just shift things over so it lines up better. We'll talk about that more in an upcoming video on editing, but it also could just be information to you, oh, I just need to be singing a little bit faster to make sure that I get that word where I want it to be, right? Or if you're playing guitar, make sure that I get that chord right on the downbeat, I'm a little bit behind, right? So you can see visually lined up with this grid where different things are landing and figure out where you might be a little bit behind or ahead and they can help tighten up your performances which are going to give you a better final sounding product so okay we'll go ahead and delete that because i don't need whatever random words i just said there in this session okay so that is the workspace and the grid this is really really important and then on the side here we have our tracks this is kind of part of the workspace here our track headers and so with these we have mute and solo so mute is going to mute it solo is going to solo it so it's the only thing that we hear then we have a volume slider. So as I bring this down here, this is going to be turning the volume of this track down. As I bring it up, it's gonna be turning the volume of the track up. If you hold option and click on the keyboard, it will put it back to the default position. So it's back at zero here. And zero just means it's not adding or taking away any volume. And then we have our pan knob. This is just gonna put it off to one side. So if I play this now, you'll only hear the drums in one ear. And then if I pan it off to this side, you'll only hear the drums in the other ear. Right, so that's the pan knob, we have that for each. And we can relabel our tracks here just by double clicking on the name. Okay, so that is the track headers. And then let's talk about this project menu up here where we're seeing all this information. So you'll see the first section in default mode is just gonna show us our bar and our beat. So that's the location of this playhead here. And so we can see, okay, we're on the sixth measure, fourth beat. You really just need this if like, let's say you have a really big session and you're like, where's my playhead? Or where is, if you're trying to figure out, okay, this seventh beat, uh, you know, first, seventh measure, first beat, like you can kind of figure out things that way. It can be helpful. Generally speaking, I don't really pay much attention to this, but it can be helpful. Then we have our tempo. And this is really important because you've got to figure out the right tempo for your song. And you want to figure that out before you get too deep in the recording process. So you need to set this tempo from the start if you can. Um, and I shouldn't say if you can, it's important when you're recording that you figure out the tempo before you get into recording because you need to be playing to a metronome and getting recorded into the tempo of the song, especially if you want to use any virtual instruments like the drummer. So you can see here right now it's at 110. If I play this, this is the tempo. If I drag this way up and let's say make it 178, now it's a fair amount faster, right? So that's the tempo. We'll put it back to 110 for now. but. Again, figure out your tempo before you work on your song, before you record your song, and you can just play around with this and then set your metronome, try playing to that, and see if you feel like it. you are playing faster than the metronome you've set. Maybe turn up the tempo a little bit. Once you find that sweet spot, uh, it will work for you. So play around with the tempo, find where it's working for you and your song that you're working on. Then we have our time signature. This is if you're working in any different time signatures uh, and you want to again be sure to set that at the start of your session. And then finally, we have the key of the song. So if you plan on using the built-in uh, vocal tuning, which is pretty limited, but can definitely give you vocal tuning, you want to be sure you set this at the start because if you start recording audio and MIDI tracks and all that stuff, software instruments, then this will no longer work for you. It's gonna change the key of all those different elements relative to how much you change this. So if I go just down to a D uh, sharp major, it's going to shift everything down to semitones, right? Because that's the relative amount that I went down based compared to what it was set on in default. So you wanna, if you, if you think you'll need to use the auto-tune function, then try to set this at the start. Um, and if you don't know the key of your song, then there's actually some websites where you can record a snippet of your song, export out the audio, and then upload it to that to figure out the key of your song. That might be helpful to you. Um, and then some basic music theory is always helpful as well. Okay, and then so that's the project menu section. The only other thing is here, if you click on this, you can change this to show you other options. The only other one I ever really do is time. If I just wanna see like how long my total song is or at what point, at what minute does this come in? You know, if I have an intro that ends at 30 seconds, that's helpful for me sometimes. So sometimes I'll switch that to time, but generally I keep it in beats and project just the default. Okay, so that's the project menu. And then we have our transport controls. So this is how we move around inside GarageBand. The first one here is just gonna be a back by one bar 
button, then we have a forward by one bar button, and then we have return to the beginning of the session. But we can also do that on the keyboard just by hitting return on the keyboard. It will put us back at the very beginning of the session and then we can play. And then we have a play button, which you can also do just with the space bar. So I often just tap the space bar to start and stop. And then we have record, which won't matter on a drummer track, but if we're on this MIDI track here, if I hit R on the keyboard, then I can start recording. Or if I just press this button, it will automatically start recording. And then finally, we have the cycle region, which is just going to repeat a section over and over again. So every time I play, it's just gonna start from the very beginning of this song. Right, pretty cool. Okay, so that's the transport controls. That's how you move around in the session. Let's talk about the metronome because this is really, really, really important. If you want your audio to be lined up with any sort of virtual instrument, in particular the drummer, because virtual instruments you could kind of change out, but in particular the drummer or any sort of loop or anything like that, you really need to record it to a metronome. And in general, I encourage you to record a metronome no matter what, just because getting locked into a sense of time, it is not natural at first if you're not used to it, but getting comfortable with it will help your recordings tremendously. So this metronome up here, you can just click on and off in this top corner here. You can also do it with K on the keyboard. We'll turn that off and on. And then we have a count in. So what a count in will do is if we're recording, so if we just hit play, a count in's not gonna do anything different. But if we hit R or the record button up here, it's gonna give us four beats and then start playing the song. And you, you can actually go up into your uh, settings up here to record count in and make it two bars if you'd rather have eight or you know just two full bars to count in before it starts recording for you and that can be helpful and also if let's say you want to start recording on measure nine if i hit record now it's going to just start on measure eight but then start recording on measure nine which is helpful uh, just to make sure that you have some lead in before you start recording so i love the count in feature you can turn this off and on with shift k on the keyboard which can be helpful so metronome with k count in with shift k uh, and then so that's the metronome. And then finally, let's talk about all these random kind of buttons that are floating throughout. Uh, now, up here, you'll see notes in the top left-hand corner. You can actually type a note uh, here. So if you want to say like, oh, vocals too loud, right? Or change drum sound, drum sound. You can like make notes to yourself or if you're sending this project to a friend to record on, you can make notes there. Really cool, I love the note feature. And then we have loops and this is where you can pull in any loop that you might want. So uh, I often use it to find like tambourine parts or any sort of, am I spelling tambourine wrong? Yeah, I am, interesting. And it even showed there's a tambourine spelled wrong in here. That's funny. Um, I can find different tambourine parts or shaker parts or any percussion that I want. A kibasa is one that I use a lot. So I can find a kibasa sound and drag that in. So I use loops for little things like that all the time, but you could also use them to find some sort of just inspiring MIDI loop or drum loop or anything like that. So play around with the loops. You can sort them by instrument or genre or descriptor. So there's a lot of ways to look through them. And then if you have any favorites, you can just mark them. And then when you click favorites here, it's just gonna bring up your favorites really quickly. So loops are cool uh, you can open and close this with o on the keyboard which is nice and then over here if we jump all the way over to the left side we have our library which we can open with y then we have this question mark quick help button which will show you if we turn it on here it'll show you down here if you hover over something what it is so that can be helpful if you're brand new to GarageBand. then we have our smart control window which we can open and close with b on the keyboard as well and then we have our editor window, which we can open and close with E on our keyboard as well. That's a little scissors right there. And then we have the plus track button, which will just bring up an option to create a new track. And then we have the follow playhead button. So this one's kind of interesting. You know, I, I often don't like my computer to follow the playhead. So that just means that it's going to keep in line with wherever the playhead is but we can turn it off and then it's just gonna keep us looking at whatever it is we're looking at. So sometimes I prefer that. Uh, that's something over time you'll figure out whether or not you do or don't prefer. And then the final one here is if you're on an audio track, you actually have a tuner function, which is really cool. It's listening to whatever the source track is listening to. So if you wanna sing and figure out what note you're singing, you could actually do it into this tuner to just see what note it is. Or more realistically, if you're playing a guitar and you just need to tune it up really quickly, you can tune with this tuner, which is super cool, super helpful that they included that. 
Oh, and actually one final, final thing is this volume fader up here. So I almost forgot it because literally you should just leave this set to zero. So if you look at it, it says plus 0.0. .0. That's what you want. So if you've messed with it, just hold option on the keyboard and click on it and we'll put it back to zero. Trust me on this, it's more headache than it's worth. This is the master output of your session. So if you bring it up and then your song is too loud then it's going to create digital distortion or if you bring it down and forget that you've turned it down it's going to make your song quieter than it needs to be so just keep that at zero and if you're not hearing your song or because it's too quiet turn up your output on your interface whatever you're listening to your music on or just the output volume on your computer uh, and if it's too loud just turn it down <laughs> Okay, so that is a quick walkthrough of everything you need to know in GarageBand. We've covered, at this point, more or less everything. In the next video, we're going to go through how audio actually moves around inside GarageBand, which is super important to understand if you're going to be recording and mixing audio. If you don't understand how it's moving around, because it's kind of going on behind the scenes, you can't know unless you know, which is why you got to watch this video coming up tomorrow, it's really important that you understand the signal flow. So, okay, that is everything in terms of the workspace, transport controls, project menu, all that stuff. As long as you understand this stuff, you should be confident as you're moving around inside GarageBand. Be sure to grab the Ultimate GarageBand Guide completely free from link in the description below. It's really gonna help you out. If this video is helpful, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow with another video.